Boris Johnson parties, etc. Sky News obviously caught him at the airport. Uh, there's some film of that. And Boris Johnson has insisted fresh claims he broke lockdown rules are total nonsense and the elements of his, ministry, his ministerial diary were cherry-picked and then handed to police. Tell me about it all. Yeah, so this is a, a great get by Sky News' James Matthews, who who basically doorstepped Boris Johnson at the airport. And uh, as I say, terrific journalism. He was basically being bounced around by the security like a ping-pong ball. But um, effectively, w- what that interview shows is is very palpably you can see how angry Boris Johnson is about all of this I mean over the last few days since the story broke his uh, spokespeople have been furiously denying any wrongdoing and their position is that all of these events were lawful Um, but what I find interesting is from Johnson's interview with Sky uh, overnight is his insinuation that these were all cherry-picked, these Mm -hmm. these diary entries, as though someone has gone through his diary, picked out a load of things, and then caused real hardship for him by passing it on to police. It's important, I think, from a factual perspective, just to point out that I don't think that's the case. Um, The process, effectively, here, how this came to end up in the possession of the police is, is as follows. Boris Johnson is preparing... Uh, for the COVID inquiry, which is going to happen in the coming months. He has a, a group of lawyers which are paid for by the taxpayer, which whose client is actually the Cabinet Office, not him. Mm-hmm. And the COVID inquiry w- requested a number of diary entries, specific dates from his official diary, which is not his property, it's government property. And so the, the, the lawyers representing the Cabinet Office and him were going through these diary entries that had been requested and they found things that they thought could possibly, and it's to, to stress, possibly be uh, problematic uh, when looked against COVID rules. So they then flagged those to the Cabinet Office. And then the Cabinet Office, these were civil servants in the Cabinet Office, not ministers. They then determined that they were obligated under the Civil Service Code to refer these mm-hmm. to the police. Because if they hadn't, that would have effectively been you can imagine the implications if that yeah. had come out later, that they'd suppress that information. It'd be cover-up, political pressure applied. So I think Johnson Johnson's clearly furious. Uh, his people are accusing everybody, effectively, who operates within the Cabinet Office of, of trying to stitch him up. But I think, actually, if you actually look at what happened, you can understand why, why this referral has been made. So, I mean, I guess, so, two questions. Firstly, at what point do we think... Rishi Sunak knew about this. Did you know about it when Boris Johnson did? Did you know about it when the Cabinet Office raised concerns or not until they'd spoken to police? Well, I think the insinuation from Johnson's camp is that the Prime Minister must have known uh, that this was happening because he's the Prime Minister. Mm -hmm. But uh, my understanding of what happened effectively is that officials make contact with the police last week at some point and and then in between the first point of contact with the police and the actual diary entries being handed to the police. At some point, the Deputy Prime Minister, Oliver Dowden, who is in charge of the Cabinet Office, he is then told that this referral is happening. He doesn't have any executive power to sign off or prevent it, but he's told. So uh, nobody really knows actually when Mm. the Prime Minister was told. I imagine after Dowden was informed, he felt he would have felt obligated to to tell the Prime Minister. Um, but as far as whether the Prime Minister sanctioned this, I mean, all the evidence I've seen so far, and based on all the conversations I've had, suggests that the Prime Minister didn't really have any involvement in it. Sure, and from the other end then, I mean, there's a degree of kind of sort of smirking and gloating, oh, Boris Johnson messed up, he was preparing his defence, and mm. he didn't anticipate that if he was giving this stuff to the lawyers, they'd be passing it on. But from what you're saying, he actually had no choice. This was like, then these diaries aren't his property. Yeah. They had access to them anyway. Well, he said actually in his interview with, with Sky News that there's thousands and thousands of entries in his diary and he didn't even know about these entries because they're as i said government property so uh, you can understand why he's also un- un- you know angry because it came like a bolt from the blue mm-hmm. for him uh, but i think the reality is the reason why he's so cross is because yet again he's being thrust back into the spotlight over partygate the one issue amongst all of the issues that he would rather avoid talking about. Yeah, sure. Well, look, let's move on from that for a bit. Uh, front page of the Times today. Uh, foreign teachers are being offered 10 grand a year, 10 grand extra rather, to fill maths and science posts. This comes amid, of course, teachers being on strike over pay and net migration, hitting a record high of 606,000. Uh, tricky balancing act here. For Well, let's talk about the government first. So it's quite hard to say you're going to offer this money 
because we haven't got enough teachers while also saying we're not going to we're fighting the pay increases for teachers right yeah this is this is a this is exposes a massive tension in the government's policy on on public sector pay uh, last weekend in the sunday times i published a story about the fact that the the government had just received the pay recommendation from the independent pay review body for teachers which is at and they recommended a 6.5% salary increase for teachers this year which is way above what the government was mm. hoping for uh, the government's now in a real they've got a real headache on their hands they've got to debate what they do but as you say there's this there's been this year long standoff about how much pay extra pay teachers should get uh, because of inflation but and, and the fact that their pay is being eroded but the government's trying to control inflation and trying to do things that are affordable within its own spending envelope. But this obviously does suggest that it, is this, are they kind of uh, being a bit short-sighted here? You know, if you're offering £10,000 bonuses to people to come here, then I think a lots of teachers will be reading that story and thinking, well, hang on a second. Mm. How come you can offer teachers from overseas £10,000, but you can't increase my pay? So yeah. this story isn't going to help with those negotiations with the, the teaching unions. And also just the logic of bringing in teachers from elsewhere when, when you could be doing more to hold on to teachers that we already have to stop people from leaving the profession and, and so on. Absolutely. And this is, this is the key thing. The reason why they are looking for teachers overseas, a bit like in the NHS, they're recruiting thousands and thousands of nurses from overseas, is because they are struggling not only to recruit, but to retain teachers within mm. the profession because teachers are leaving because they think they can get better pay elsewhere. Um, so it, it does expose this issue. It, that, and also last year, the um, the Department for Education, it missed every single one of its recruitment targets for different subjects. Mm -hmm. It's not just maths and, and science. It's across pretty much the board, which is why the teaching unions are arguing, well, you've got to increase pay um, for everybody if you want to hit your recruitment targets and stop people from leaving the profession in their droves. But because of where we are economically, I, I think this issue is just going to run and run. Yeah. Well, look, immigration, of course, brings us to Suella Braverman and her big week. Um, Suella Braverman is, of course, well, I'm going to say one of the strongest critics of the government's record on immigration, despite being Home Secretary and thus in charge of the government's record on immigration. But that's a conundrum for her. But look, I mean, I wanted to ask, would we have heard more from her this week, do you think, about immigration had she not had a tricky week over the whole kind of speeding fine stuff? And if so... It, well, you can understand why there's a sort of like conspiracy theory that it was the blob trying to shut her up, right? <laughs> yeah, well, I can speak with a bit of authority on this. Do you know, I thought you could. Speaking yeah, yeah. fine story, <laughs> having, uh, having broken it last weekend. Uh, so I can't really uh, play the, the role of a mind reader, but certainly some people I've su spoken to have suggested that she's been very quiet since mm -hmm. that story broke. Obviously, the Prime Minister decided not to refer her to the independent advisor over the story, um, you would think that might have earned the Prime Minister a bit of loyalty from the Home Secretary and therefore she felt the need to uh, keep quiet. But she had actually really already set her stall out the week before at the National Conservative Conference. And as you say, you kind of alluded to this earlier, it was a kind of odd situation where you have a cabinet minister, the cabinet minister in charge of our immigration policy, effectively saying the, this government must do this. Mm -hmm. um, when And many critics have pointed out, privately and publicly, well, you are the minister in charge yeah. of this. So, um, But to go back to your question, yes, I think it, we may have seen, maybe not on the record, but we may have seen a bit of mischief from her political allies mm. a bit more had this story not broken. Yeah, yeah, fascinating indeed. Look, before I let you go, uh, Jeremy Hunt this week talking about rises in interest rates that are starting to hurt an awful lot of people. And he said that a recession in the UK would be a price worth paying to bring inflation down. It's a hell of a thing for a Chancellor to say, isn't it? It is, but he is not the first Chancellor to have actually said that. Um, in fact, Norman Lamont, when he was Chancellor under Sir John Major, he said in, in Parliament in 1991 that... It, um, basically going into recession at the time and increasing unemployment was the, was a price worth paying to control inflation when inflation was skyrocketing. Mm. And I think what Jeremy Hunt is trying to say, I don't think he, by the way, wanted to say yeah, what sure. he said yesterday, I think it was forced out of him by a journalist, is that the government's facing a really difficult catch-22 moment with the economy here. They, they want growth but they also know that inflation is probably politically the most damaging thing they're facing because 
if they don't uh, suppress demand uh, and you don't get the supply demand issue sorted and inflation continues to increase, that that's going to be the biggest threat to the Conservative mm. Party heading to the next election. And the reason for that is, obviously, we also had the uh, the fact that we think that interest rates could go up to 5.5%, the base rate could go up to 5.5% by the end of this year. That is going to have massive political ramifications because it's going to lead to lots more people when they come to remortgage yeah. facing sky-high mortgage rates. And, you know, we're not talking a few pounds here. We're talking hundreds of mm. thousands of pounds. And the question for, for Jeremy Hunt and Rishi Sunak is, as we get closer to an election in 2024, do you really want to be heading into that when lots of ha home owning people who tend to be more likely to vote conservative are facing thousands of pounds of additional payments in their, for their mortgages? Um, and we also obviously know that because of what happened with Liz Truss, this issue is going on all around the world with interest rates. But because of the Truss disastrous mini budget, people in this country have come to associate interest rate rises and mortgage rises specifically with the Conservative government. Yeah. So that is why I think Hunt said what he said. Yeah.